All right, greetings from the dark continent. Conscious Caracal here, or Adams Fun Sale, here to shine a light on the goings on down south. And tonight, uh, joining me to shine a light here on the happenings here uh, in Africa is uh, my new guest that you might not recognize from uh, previous shows because this is his first appearance on my channel, and that is uh, Tanda Mabaso. I actually met him on uh, Sikhle Ngobise's channel. We uh, were part of a panel there uh, for a discussion, and uh, I actually really enjoyed many of his remarks that he had and what he had to say there, so I thought it would actually be a good opportunity to pick his brain in a long Longer format because he only had a limited time to to share his thoughts on that panel there that night because there was a lot of panelists but tonight it's only going to be me and Tanda we're going to be talking about a, a topic that he uh, has a lot of thoughts to share on but I also uh, have a lot of strong opinions on and that is the total state but also its relation to the family and uh, where we find ourselves today so uh, Tanda maybe just before we start uh uh, is it correct if I if I introduce you as a, a political political commentator and a business analyst? That is how you were introduced uh, by Sihle Ngobise. Does that cover it? Yes, um, the business intelligence um, developer or analyst actually. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, uh, you know I, I I obviously always happy to share my views about what's happening uh, in the world around me. Um, and lately I've been very interested in what's happening in, in the close world around me, um, around my country and around issues around family and that sort of thing and how it relates to the wider politics. And uh, yeah, so I think we're going to have a great discussion today. Hmm. Well, no, I'm, I'm also looking forward to it. And you're welcome on the show. So maybe uh, something I think where we can start off is with uh, the first part of the title and that is the concept of the total state this this leviathan that just reigns over millions of people it's not a model that's uh, unique to South Africa it's a model that you find actually in in quite a few cases all across the world and it seems to be a model that a lot of people ascribe to as the future as this is the this is now the end of history we are going to be living for hundreds if not thousands of years in a, a uh, in a time where uh, all across the world you're just going to see these total states these massive governments that are just increase in scope and power by the year and uh, in south africa like i told you we were discussing this off air before we went live in south africa this idea of centralism the centralized state is not something that's uh, that started in 1994 it is a philosophy that the anc ascribes to through their uh, pursuit of the national democratic revolution or the ndr but it's an idea that they actually uh, picked up from uh, their predecessors from thinkers and minds before them it's an idea in south africa that's been uh, having its way if i can put it that way with this region of, of africa for more than 100 years it's been the dominant idea this idea of centralism in our region uh, of africa and it's had a I think some devastating effects in regards to uh, prosperity and uh, uh, specifically also to to freedom. Um, what are some of your thoughts on uh, exactly that? What I've described there. Yeah, I think I think South Africa is a very nice case study of how um, these these type of um, you know machinations happen mm. because the story of South Africa is that of course two hundred years ago or. 300 years ago, some few hundred years ago, there was no concept called South Africa. It didn't exist as a concept. They, it was an area that had, it was just an area of, of in Africa, you know, that had a bunch of different people uh, living in it. Um, at some point, um, decisions were made by those um, people that were engaged in empire building, the colonialists, um, Portugal, um, uh, France, um, uh, Britain being the main and Germany as well, um, where they decided that they wanted to expand um, their their lands and they began to draw borders around random play. Well, I call them random. They seem random to me. I'm sure they weren't random to them. They had a specific reason of why they would want to apportion this particular piece of land in this way or that way. But that didn't speak to how the people were living first of all, at the time. Um, a simple example, we talk today about Zulu people, but when you go in history, the, the term Zulu people is actually not quite what we say today. We, today we talk about the people that speak the Zulu language and we think they're just one group of people and they weren't. They themselves were divided into many different groups. 
um, you know, that had slightly different beliefs and slightly different practices. That's just how, um, and that's true of the Kosa people. We call them Kosa, but actually there's Abatembu, there's the Bondo, there's the there's the Kosa, they, and they have they they claim their different kings amongst themselves. So it was really a, a lot of different groups, and that's how naturally human beings gather themselves. They don't, you know, in a school of a hundred kids, there'll be at least ten groups of you know, at least 10 groups of, 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 of friends, probably even more. You normally have groups of like maximum five. It's because it's very difficult to find people that all agree on how things should run. And that's why people tend to end up segmenting themselves. But of course, for those who are engaged in empire building, they're not so interested in how people feel like, you know, um, uh, um, how, how they feel like, you know, putting themselves together. What they're concerned about is, is resources, what's the most efficient way to, to, to be able to extract resources from a certain area, be able to use people for whatever um, industries or purposes that they might uh, have in mind. And therefore, that's what you saw in, in, in Africa, it's what you saw in America and Asia. Um, but it's been the case, it's, I don't also want to pin it on colonialism because that's a new thing. Empire building has been around since Bible times, at least. You know, there's always been somebody trying to build an empire, trying to extract resources, trying to extract taxes from people or whatever the case may be. That's it's something that's always been there. It's not a new thing. Um, and 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 it's 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 never done for the welfare of the people who are going to be ruled. Um, but the only difference today is that as these empires are being built, there's there's a lot more propaganda of trying to make people believe this isn't an empire you know this is actually right. a, a a you know a, a lovely thing of the human family coming together and we're all going to love each other and we're all going to live in a nice utopia so there's a lot more propaganda now than there used to be before because before they didn't have the propaganda you knew the you know i was under the rome i'm under the roman empire i'm being ruled by the roman empire and you know that eventually i need to fight you know to get out of you know under their rule so that we can be independent right. again but in order to prevent that, there's been a lot more propaganda that has been, um, you know, put forward these days, you know, with the it, it, invention of the printing press and all other types of media that allows them to communicate to large numbers of people. The, the, these efforts have been underpinned by a much better propaganda network that kind of makes people accept this empire building as if it's something normal and even something good and desirable. Mm. Like I said, it, it's framed as this is the way of the future. We have now arrived in the future. This is the way human beings need to be organized and we need to uh, continue to push that forward. And uh, yeah, before we continue, I actually want to answer a question here in the chat. Uh, Tando Sono asks, I'm not clear with the explanation of the total state. Please give examples. So to put it very simply in regards to the total state, it's this idea that uh, society has a lot of problems, of course, and those problems need to be solved. And the only way to solve those problems, one of which is conflict, is to create this highly centralized state that manages all the affairs of everyone in that society. All the individuals and all the communities in that, in that society are administered by that. All their affairs are administered by the state and all their conflicts are uh, are. Uh, um, are managed by the state so the state uh, in this philosophy of the total state is always seeking more power more influence more uh, uh, control over every facet of life so for example um in medicine the state uh, wants an influence and a cut uh, of that uh, in defense, the state wants a cut of that. In security, the, the state wants influence in that. Uh, in conflict mitigation between uh, communities, the state uh, wants influence in that. And it's it's not that the state is just this uh, uh, independent entity that is uh, gobbling up as much power as it wants. It has a lot of enablers uh, within the population that truly believe that uh, the state apparatus, the centralized government, is the true way of uh, organizing human beings, as Tanda explained. And it's an idea that we see all across the world where, for example, a good example of uh, uh, the state meddling in medicine is, for example, vaccine mandates, where we saw all across the world governments took it upon themselves to say, well, um, this is uh, uh, what we see as the common good in regards to people's health, or that's how they framed it. And they said, therefore, we are going to mandate our populations uh, to, to get this, uh, this treatment. And that's just one example. Another example is, for example, the insecurity where 
the majority and let's take South Africa, the majority of South Africans depend on the police force for their security. If there is any type of uh, disturbance in their community, any type of criminal activity, uh, any type of physical threat to them, they have to call the police. Um, and that's uh, that's what they, what they are dependent on. And the police are an arm of the state. Um, whereas uh, the opposite of that would be a de decentralized security where you get neighborhood watches, uh, you get communities organizing to uh, be vigilant about what's going on in their streets and in their neighborhoods. You'd get communities organizing to, uh, to deal with criminal elements within their communities. But uh, just the final thought there on the total state is you, the philosophy of it is basically the other word for it would be centralism or centralization. Everything needs to be centralized in one key point. Everything needs to be in control by a smaller and more con uh, a more concentrated uh, group of people within the government. And uh, the more facets of society that are under control of this small group of government officials uh, or uh, rather, a small group of government officials ruling over a massive bureaucracy, rather, uh, I should rather say, um, the more uh, the state uh, gains control over that society. And like I said earlier, to, just to finish off, many people see this as the future. They see this as the solution. They want the government to be their father. They want the government to be their, their parent. They want the government to be the babysitter, judge, jury, and executioner over their society. And they think that will create, as Tanda said, a utopia and a peaceful society where if nobody, where everyone is free of want and uh, the state can provide security and prosperity. And uh, that is pretty much just utopian thinking uh, con uh, in essence. Yeah, that's, uh, I think that's a very, um, you know, a perfect description of it. And what's important to understand is um, the state is not necessarily, because people sometimes think, especially when it's um, framed in the idea of being a democracy, as something that is organic, that comes out of, you know, the people's uh, you know, the, necessarily their desires and, and it's just, you know, the people in government, they sometimes call themselves public representatives. We're just representing the will of the people. Um, when, as, as the state becomes uh, bigger, as the bureaucracy becomes bigger, as the people they rule over becomes bigger, as we discussed, um, it becomes such that the people who are leaders are people that people don't personally know. They don't know where they come from. They don't know exactly how, why this, um, you're made to choose between this person and that person, but you don't know either of these people. And you're just trusting what gets advertised to you about those people. So there becomes a, 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 a deficit of trust where you kind of have to blind, have blind faith that whoever is being presented to you as a potential leader um, is good because they are famous. You know, that, that's ultimately what it comes down to. South Africa has lots of many good people, but whenever it comes time to um, have an election, I'm having to choose between Cyril Ramaphosa, uh, Helen Zill, um, you know, John Steen Hazen and, and um, Julius Malema. Those are just the choices. And I don't know any of these people, never met them. I don't know what they like. I don't, I, I don't know what kind of person they're like when they're angry. I don't know anything about them at all. But I'm forced to, to put my life in their hands. And as, as the state gets stronger, more of your life becomes in the hands of the state, of people that you don't know and you don't have a connection to. And unfortunately, as, as we will discuss, those people are not always serving most of the time they're not serving the, the, your actual needs. You are just a means to an end. They just need your vote so that they can push through certain things that, you know, those who are their donors and those who, who um, you know, fund them and their lifestyle or their parties. You know, we had the whole state capture commission that's just, uh, you know, gone on and lifted the lid on people who behind the scenes actually control the people who pretend to represent us. And so uh, that, that's what it becomes liable to. Um, 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 when you have a state, and that's why it's not a desirable state of affairs. Um, to sorry for the pun, and uh, it's it's uh, it's something that we need to discuss why it exists and and maybe what solutions we can have for it. Mm, absolutely, and I, I think that is 
what you described there is one of the massive challenges of our time is the alternative because like i said this is an idea that has gripped uh, millions of people's minds for in south africa at least for over a hundred years it's been sold as the solution it's been sold as uh, this is the only tool that uh, will ever be necessary so when you're when your only tool that you have is a hammer every problem problem will look like a nail and uh, that's pretty much what we're seeing there. Our tool that we are sold, as you said, just as politicians are sold to us, uh, the, the the tools of of problem solving are also sold to us. And the only uh, the the monopoly uh, seems to be on uh, the the state centralization hammer as the only tool that you'll ever need to solve every problem. It doesn't matter if you have to saw. Uh, a plank in half or whether you have to drive in a screw you can just use the hammer you can use the state centralization hammer to hit that plank uh, in half or you can use it to hit the screw into the wood that's how it's sold to you and um, i think like i said the big challenge is that mindset shift we, we have to realize that uh, in the end uh, if we don't try the alternative if we don't uh, even if we can't even imagine the alternative we are going to be stuck um, in this uh, state centralization paradigm for another generation at least it's like uh, uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein said that uh, a man will be trapped inside a room with one door that opens inward if he only continues to push that door and it never occurs to him that he needs to pull it. And I think that is exactly where we are today with the state centralization model. Um, but to uh, to actually uh, progress that point to the to the next phase is uh, or the next half of the title of today's episode, the total state uh, and the family. Um, I think one of the last bastions of defense against uh, this, uh, as we just both of us described earlier, this creeping influence and control of the state is the family. And it's not just in South Africa, it's all across the world, specifically in the Western world. And that's why you see all these attacks on the idea of the family, all these attacks on the, the idea of keeping families together and uh, the family having a, a say in the in the affairs of their children. Um, so this is actually something that uh, I think you also uh, that we talked about when we were on Sichle's channel. Um, so I'd like to have your your introductory thoughts so long uh, on that. But you can also add if you have anything else that you wanted to add to my previous thoughts on uh, on uh, the paradigm shift that's needed. Yeah. So so on the previous thoughts about uh, mm. the paradigm shift, I, I like that word paradigm because it's 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 it is as you say it's a room in which you think about things. So. What, what, what happens though is that in this room you um, there, there are a lot of kind of objects within the room that make you think that there's some sort of variety. So we, we, we obviously when we talk about the states we, we have arguments around the states. We say um, we, should we go capitalism? Should we be doing communism or socialism or should it be mixed? Should it be a democracy? Should it be a monarchy? Should it be you know, and we have all these different type of things that we try to solve, um, uh, and 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 we think we are arguing with each other, and we think we are proposing different solutions, but ultimately we are all proposing statism, right? <laughs> In just right. one model or another, um, because different flavors. Exactly. Different flavors of exactly the same thing. You are still in that in that proverbial room that you that that, that, that you described. Um, you're just moving through different corners of it. And so that's that that that's that's what people need to realize that that's where we're stuck in as a country. We're stuck. We think we're arguing with each other. We think we have different perspectives. We think we, we see things differently. But those who um, uh, push statism are just laughing at us because they know that ultimately we are just we're all arriving at their conclusion. They want us to arrive to that the state must do something. Mm -hmm. So the, to, to, to progress to that on, on, on to um, talking about the, the family as, a, as how, how that is an alternative. Um, as I said, people, the, the, the natural tendency of people is to associate themselves with people that they know, uh, that they love and that love them or care about them at least, that they that will be able to um and to trust them to lead them you understand that's the that, that's the nature of, of of how human beings are most of the time and so as a result from you know hundreds and thousands of years um human beings have organized themselves in families 
you know, and in the family, there's been some sort of a government's day. Um, most of the time, it's most families around the world and most cultures have been patriarchal. There's a father at the head, but there's also, you know, there can't be a father without a mother. And they, 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 they have had a lot of power and a lot of ability to guide their family according to their family's uh, needs, um, to respond to, you know, the needs of individuals within the family. Now, the, 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 the love that is, exists in a family, the loyalty that exists in a family can be a problem when you're trying to build an empire because um, you, you, you then have a lot of people that you're kind of answerable to, um, you know, all these heads of families, you have to answer to them. And if you don't satisfy them, they can tell their families that, no, we're not going, you know, this way or that way. So if you're trying to build uh, an empire kingdom, this is a, a family is a families can are a problem. They're a stumbling block. So what you want to do is you kind of want to um, loosen the bonds within a family. You want to, if you can, um, you know, have a way of doing away with them. Um, so you watch movies like The Matrix at some point where they, you know, children just are just getting created, you know, so there aren't really any families. People are just right. getting created. They're just these little individuals that, you know, don't mean anything. So you, 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 you try and find ways of how can you shake things up in the family. So there's been many things that were that happened, you know, to kind of do that in in the South African context, in in in, in the African families con uh, context. Migrant labor was one of the things that happened that kind of removed fathers from their homes and um, began kind of a spiral that we see today with a lot of dysfunctions in in in, in townships and basically among black families. So it's one of those things, um, but also creating distrust between members of the family. So in this regard, feminism is one of the things that, um, you know, was used to basically say, your husband or your father doesn't like you. They hate you. They want to oppress you. We, the state, are offering a solution for you to be able to escape from that oppression so that you can be free from family. And we will empower you. And, and you know what I mean? And you people don't see that but that is a way of trying to create that distrust between families so that family is no longer the, the the focus that people have so that people can start actually looking towards um so, so that they can start actually looking towards the, the the state for their solutions and not looking towards each other um and that's really it's the divide and conquer principle basically uh in action divide them divide them from their families um have them you know uh, uh, living alone distressing each other so that they become aimless and that there will be problems and when there are problems and they don't trust each other who will they look to for a solution they'll look to us as the state and we will be able to offer them whatever solutions are convenient for us and the people that fund us, basically. Mm. Well, absolutely. Why do you think uh, men are increasingly viewed as expendable in our, in our society? Not even not just in South Africa, but uh, in the Western world and the uh, specifically, um, where men are just seen as well. What uh, what are they good for? To put it very very bluntly. That's the type of zeitgeist that is reigning. That's the type of idea that we're hearing. And then, and I, I, it's it's not strange for me that that is the state of affairs because we've we live in a in a time where, exactly as you describe there, men throughout history in the family, their role was firstly to provide security and protection, and to provide resources and uh, uh, for survival and for prosperity. What does the state offer today to to its subjects or whatever you want to call them? Security and protection and resources. That's exactly the male's role that has been historically for uh, historic historically been the male's role for thousands of years, and now the state uh, is offering exactly the same thing. So why do you think uh, you just see uh, the this narrative of uh, men being obsolete or men being just treated like they're expendable. Look at, for example, many of the issues that are plaguing uh, men in our society. They are not, uh, they're not addressed. Uh, if you look at South Africa, um, what percentage of murders in South Africa are men being murdered? Um, but it's, it's not talked about, uh, even though it's, uh, it's the massive, massive majority of murders in this country um, no, and uh, horrible murders. Excuse me? Yeah, 80% of the Yeah, it's 80%. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the thing is, 
when it comes to what we're seeing happen around us is there's no better i named this example and when, when you and i were on the sikhles channel uh, i named the example of in south africa where during the pandemic during the lockdowns we saw millions of south africans of all races all backgrounds all communities starting to talk about the presidential addresses that the president did we addressed the nation we people started talking about them as family meetings not in a joking manner not in a non-serious or trivial manner in a serious manner they were talking about it as if this is now the family coming together and we're going to be talking about the problems that are affecting our family and uh, with Cyril, of course in this metaphor or in this uh, in this scenario being the father the father figure people were talking about daddy Cyril and father Cyril and uh, he uh, and in, Afri in Afrikaans it would be Wim Cyril uh, Mr Cyril it was this whole idea of he is this father figure and he's going to guide us through this uh, through this this crisis just as you explained there just as you explained where for the majority of our history you had the father figure at the head of the family guiding the family through hard and difficult times being that strong leader when times are tough and when the family is threatened that is what has happened in the past few years when it comes to government in south africa and not just in south africa in many other countries the government is being treated by millions of people as their father or their mother but basically as their parental figure their authoritative parental figure and they listen to that government as if it is their father or their mother that can scold them, that can punish them, that can take away privileges, that can take away resources, that can put them in jail or ground them would be the, meta, the, the equivalent if you're a child, that can inflict violence on them even as a, a, a parent uh, would punish their, their children through, for example, uh, spanking them. But uh, th I'm taking that metaphor as far as I can. But, I mean, you've noticed this too, Tanda. I remember when we were on Sikhle's channel, uh, you seemed to uh, be, in, be in agreement with me there that this is a, a very sick state of affairs where, that, we, that we saw unfold in South Africa in that regard. Yeah, look, you, we see it everywhere. We see it um, not just uh, in government uh, calling themselves, you know, having that, that idea of family, but um, as a, the government being your family. But also we see in companies uh, saying that, you know, we're a family in the company, you know, we're, we're, we're families. And we're seeing discussions about, you know, all these types of alternative uh, types of families that are basically with everything that must be recognized as a family. So the issue here is that because they have successfully managed to destroy many families, but they haven't destroyed the human need and desire to be in a family. So exactly. what you then yeah, so what you then do is you offer you you destroy the the actual family and then you present some other solution and say this solution it can be your family. You know, you 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 you, you we're a few, the world community, or you know the you know the world community, or whatever they want to call humanity it. is one big family. The human humanity is one family, and that sort of thing. So they they then push these types of concepts because you still naturally have that desire for family. We are social animals. We've been social since we were uh, created. If you believe in the Bible, we were created, you know, as uh, with, 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 with a man and a woman and, and their children. So that was a family. But if you don't believe in the Bible, then for millions of years, we've been social animals like our closest ancestors, the chimpanzees. We've always been. So yeah, you can never- No matter what away, angle you look at it, yeah. Yes. So you can never take away that innate desire we have to be in a family. But so what the government does is it destroys the actual family that actually has people that would care about you and love you because they know you and understand you. Then they, they create distrust in the family so that the families can get broken up. We all know about the divorce rates, but we also all know about the fact that people are not marrying at all and are not starting families at all um and and they make they, they they destroy that so that they can offer themselves as as the savior and that's one of the things i mentioned on on, on CFS show that i um is that these governments what they do is they create the problem then they present the solution hmm. it's what they always do they create the problem then they present the solution. So let's take something like crime, for example. Do you think in those, you know, 500 years ago when we had all these, you know, things were like more community-based and, and whatever, do you think we had the crime rates that we have today? 
in the centralized governments. In South Africa, in, in the US, everywhere in the world, we, we, we know about all the mass shootings and, and all types of crimes that are happening. We didn't have that type of, we didn't have that level of crime. That level of crime happened when you start trying to mix and mash people who don't understand each other. You, you create an economic system that doesn't really, is, isn't able to take care of everybody. And it's only under those circumstances that we have the, the type of crimes that we have, we are seeing today. We didn't have them before. So the state creates the crimes, that creates the problem, which is crime in this case. Then it says, we will solve it for you. Give us more money and we will provide more police officers or we'll build more prisons or we will we, we will have more judges. We will do this. But uh, we, we, we we've will, created... We'll write more laws. <laughs> we'll write more laws. Exactly. We'll write more laws. And, 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 and um, you know, we're going to raise the age of, of drinking from, from what, what was it, 18 to 21, even though the people... The most bizarre ran, example this 13, week. Okay. We're 13 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Even though the people who died were 13 yeah. years old. <laughs> um, Earlier, before you continue, just to give that context to people that are maybe unaware. So it, it's actually a very tragic story, but the solution that government gave for it is the most bizarre. So unfortunately, uh, recently in South Africa, uh, 21 uh, miners died in a tavern. We don't know the cause yet exactly, but this was an alcohol serving uh, establishment. That's the context that I think is important. And all these victims were under the age of 18, some as young as 13 or 14. But then the president of South Africa came out and said the solution that we maybe need to uh, um, need to think about is or to consider is to up the legal drinking age to 21. Now, that's exactly I just want to give that context because that so perfectly demonstrates what you're talking about here. Like I said earlier, we will create another law. We will refine the law. That is how we yeah. will uh, solve these problems. But it is so disconnected from reality. It is, it's, it's actually laughable. Yeah, but please yeah. continue. I just wanted to give that context for people, maybe uh, international listeners that don't know. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So that's the, that, that. That's really the issue at hand. Um, and 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 uh, you know, that's pretty much it. Destroy the family, create problems, offer offer yourself as a solution to the problems that you created, um, and um, so so that you can centralize you know power within yourself. Remember now, families are not allowed to spank their own children anymore. Mm. You understand. You, yeah. you're not you, you, you're not allowed to spank uh, your, your your own children you know you, so you you've been curtailed only, with only the government violence. is allowed to, to use only the government is allowed to administer violence now you know so who would you rather administer violence to you when you were a child your parent that loves you and knows you or some stranger who's a police officer or a, or a soldier or whatever they are you know if you were to ask a child they'd prefer that their own parents does it's not 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 some people that they don't know but that's that that's what the government is doing it's taking it's actually it, it it's taking away power from the people centralizing it to himself and but it, it has such a good propaganda network that people don't actually realize what's going on yeah no, absolutely. And that's that's why I picked tonight's topic, because I think this is integral. It is at the core of many of the problems in South Africa, not just uh, this assault on the family and this uh, chipping away of the family, but also the statism behind it, the centralization philosophy behind it. And I think, like I said uh, earlier, this conversation uh, is uh, mostly uh, surrounding South Africa, but it is something, a phenomenon that we see all across the world. It might even be an idea that was imported into South Africa. I think the people that are pushing it are not people that just uh, was, had shower thoughts. They were standing in their shower and they figured out this is the solution. They read it somewhere in a book. They heard it somewhere on the television, uh, but from outside, not from just organic thinking. This is an idea that's very old and actually very, uh, very evil. Uh, when you start really uh, dissecting it, as we have uh, so far, and I'm really enjoying it. Um, before we uh, before we continue, I would just like to remind uh, everyone in the chat: if you have any questions, uh, don't uh, don't be shy to ask. I will try to get to as many as possible. If you have any questions regarding the topic, um, we will sure to be uh, get to uh, as many as possible. So. Tanda, maybe uh, while we're on that topic of, of the family, I want to, to stay a bit longer because I think it's it's so integral to a lot of our problems here in South Africa. But there's a facet of it that's 
that stands out to me. And some people have mentioned it in the chat, and that is fatherlessness. We've talked about the family specifically, but it's that that absent father figure in South Africa specifically that is causing so much chaos, that's causing so much harm and suffering. I think last time I saw the, the statistics, I'm talking under correction, but I think the last statistics I saw, 60% of South African children born uh, don't know who their father is. That was the last statistic that I saw. Um, what are your thoughts specifically on this facet of the crisis of the family, not just specifically the, the family, but rather the father aspect of it, uh, at, using South Africa as your, uh, as your case study? Yeah. So that, 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 that I think ties in with, um, you know, another theme that you, you mentioned, which was, you know, the crisis of masculinity. So it's, it's important to understand that throughout the history, whenever there have been revolutions against, you know, oppressive powers, those revolutions have always been, um, you know, fought ultimately by, by, by and large by men, you know, 90% of the time. Um, and, and, and they've overthrown, you know, governments upon governments of or wh wh whenever, as I said, this thing is not a new thing. It's not something that started 200 years ago. Uh, empire building is, 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 has been you know, around for thousands of years. And people have been fighting against it for thousands of years whenever they can. But the people who fight, it's not just a general thing, it's the men who fight it. So the, 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 the issue here then if, is if you're trying to be successful to build a stable uh, state in which you can continue, you can uh, continue your empire and it can have that stability, you've got to find a way of disempowering these people who pose the, who, who pose the most threats to you, which is the men. So how do you do that? First of all, you basically remove their role in the family, which we've discussed already. You remove their role in the family so that uh, they kind of get seen as as dispensable, you know. I've 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 I, I talked to a, a lady when I was in um, my grade twelve in high school, and I asked her, "Where do you want? Where do you see yourself when you're twenty five years? If everything is, happens according to you and how you want it to happen?" And she said to me, "I've got one this job, and I want a child." And then I said, "Okay, and you're going to be married, a husband?" She's like, "No, no, no, I don't want a husband. I just want uh, a child." So they, they, that, that, you know, that was, you know, uh, 18 years ago. So that is something that has already been inculcated in people that you don't actually need a father in the family. It's, it's, it's not a need. It's not a must. You know, it's not, it, you don't have to. It, you, there is other ways of doing it. And so when you begin to say, put things like that and, and get men out of the family, men now no longer have anything that they have to care about. Because what motivated those men that overthrew governments was they cared about their families and they wanted their families to live better lives. But when they're no longer in their families and they're sitting outside of their families, then they turn to alcohol or they turn to gambling or, 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 or to sports or to meaningless, me meaningless things. And they don't actually care to, to, to challenge anything. Then the second thing that you do as a government is also you must demonize men and their nature. You have to demonize that nature in them that uh, gives them the ability to overthrow governments, their masculinity, basically, their ability to be aggressive and to be violent when they need to, to be stubborn. <laughs> yes, exactly. To, to, you, you've got to make that seem like it's, it's, it's some sort of um, a, a deformity that it's, you know, it's, you've got to become a modern man who's more feminine and more in touch with himself so that you don't have these types of tendencies that they've seen um, cause their governments to be, uh, their, their previous attempts at, at uh, creating empires to be, you know, undermined and based and eventually overthrown. So men are emasculated, um, you know, the, 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 the woman, they, they, the woman can become more masculine, but they're, they're not going to take up arms against the government, you know, on their own. So it's the, it's these men that are the problem that you need to get them out of the picture. You need to get them, um, you know, dumped down and, and, you know, get their testosterone levels down and, and kind of indoctrinate them that they're bad people for being men for being what they naturally are. So there, there is actually an attack. Um, there's, uh, it, it, as part of trying to destroy the family, there was a deliberate attack on, on, on men. 
um, to, to ensure that they can't be a part of the, the formations of these families so that there's distrust within families so that everybody in the family, children, women, and everybody uh, doesn't care about each other. They only look to the states, you know, for, you know, their solutions in life. Hmm. Yeah, well, uh, Tanda, Pinar van Wijk says this gent is spitting facts. <laughs> and I, I, I have to say I definitely agree. That's uh, that's exactly what I think is going on. I see uh, uh, Koketo Rezane from the Man Patria podcast, and you also recognize him from Sikhle's panel, uh, is also in the chat here, and he asks uh, a pertinent question, which is so much effort to emasculate women uh, and to feminize men. Uh, why? And I think Tanda explained that very thoroughly. Early now, I think that's a, a, what Tanda said uh, just now is exactly what's what's going on there. Um, and John uh, Komnenos says men must be men and women must be women and cherish those roles. Yeah, what we're basically seeing in modernity now is trying to cha turn women into second-rate men into and to turn men into second-rate women. That's pretty much what we're seeing instead of creating first-class women and first-class men. Uh, we're seeing just this inversion. It's very, very strange, as Koketsu rightly points out there. Um, and I see uh, um, Miot Yuori, uh, that's correct, says modernity is anti human. This is the core focus of their attack. Um, and then Tando Sono says stripped of power, control, stripped of purpose, and giving given substances to fill the void and numb the pain. Profound from Tanda. Uh, I've, I've given the, the chat some TLC, but uh, I'm going to give uh, the microphone over again to you, Tanda, if there's anything specific that you wanted to respond to. Yeah, I, I, I like the, 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 the thoughts that, talks, that, that talked about. Um, um maybe that it's a tech on, on on humanity so we all we all watch the movies we all see um you know the matrix and and um uh, i am mother and many other uh, shows that basically talk about the future sci-fi uh, sci you know uh, sci-fi future uh, in which you have basically human beings become dis expendable they're no longer useful um, because now machines have taken over and uh, you know we can basically dispense with people ultimately so th th that's again that's what people don't realize that that can happen you know um, will it happen how far in the future would it happen I don't know but it's something that if you think about it it could happen it could already we're seeing people losing jobs to machines um and and obviously sometimes they lose jobs to machines and other jobs get created but slowly but surely it's looking as as if there's going to come a time where machines are going to be able to do the majority of the jobs and when that time happens that's why now you see wef and others discussing universal basic income or something like that where basically you you'll, you'll become a complete child to of the of, of the government and the state you won't be able to even work to you know for, for, for anything you'll just receive what they're going to give you because they'll have all the machines and all the ai to be able to do the work that you need to do yeah you just and consume you will just consume and this is an important point um, and that's how they actually get people because, you know, human beings are human beings. You like the easiest route. You know, you always try to find the easiest route in anything. So if somebody gives you um, a carrot that says you can just consume, you won't have to work. We, we will give it to you. So, you know, we, we will give you this, we'll give you that, we'll make sure, um, you know, that things are as easy for you as possible. That desire for ease that desire for um, uh, comfort, um, uh, that, that, that desire for convenience is what allows these governments to do what they're doing because they, they, they try to offer that. They offer grants or they offer, um, you know, these public services and they do all these things which makes people think, well, then I don't have to do anything. I won't have to, um, you know, fend for myself. You mentioned security. Um, just speaking from as an African person, um, you know, 200 years ago, each and every man had a spear in his house and, and, and a spear for his sons as well so that they can protect themselves. You know, they knew it was their own responsibility to protect themselves. Yeah, not don't run and else. hide and call the police. 
<laughs> yes, you don't run around and call the police. You protect yourselves. Um, but the, the, this thing says no. You don't have to protect yourself. You don't have to be. You don't have to be strong or fit or know how to fight. We'll be able to do it for you. And as you give, uh, uh, so, so that's what it sells it, and people go with that. But eventually, what they don't realize is that eventually they'll become useless. We, we are already much more useless than our forefathers. You know, they, 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 they had a lot more skills than we had. We'll have, you know, one skill that maybe we can do, but otherwise we can't really survive on our own. They could do, they were multi-talented forefathers and foremothers were, you know, multi-talented and they could do many things to, 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 to keep themselves. And they produced many things from their own home. They produced their own clothes, their own food, their own, um, you know, pottery or whatever it is that they needed. But we can't produce anything now already. We rely on, on certain companies to do that. But eventually we'll rely on machines and eventually we will be use, we will be useless. And then if they decide that we're taking up too many resources and we're consuming too much, it won't be an issue for them to, you know, kill a few of us if they need to. And yeah. don't, don't, don't think that it cannot come a time where they can do, make that decision to kill a few of us and, and, and we would accept it. We've already seen people accepting uh, people being forced to um, take vaccines um, and 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 basically go out of jobs if they are not willing to take them. Um, when the propaganda is right, you can get people to accept anything, um, including that right. some people have to be killed because there's just too many people. It will happen. So these are the things we've got to be careful of, and it will happen because when you have these big states, it's easy to become. Uh, to, for people to become numbers and not to be human beings and not to be actual people. But when you get back to families, each and every member of a family is an individual, a person that is appreciated and and um, the, the, the leader in the family, the, the father, the mother, they care about the people that they're leading and they make decisions, um, you know, keeping them in mind. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, Tanda, uh, what you described there, the, the live chat seems to be in perfect synchronicity with you there because uh, Dagbreker says he's correct. More and more people are noticing this. The human is being quantified into a single number for efficiency. And once a unit is available that can perform uh, at a higher rate, um, they will be uh, replaced. I think that's where he's going, uh, but I think he ran out of space. And then there's a comment here that I also want to hear your thoughts on that I think is absolutely the crux of it it's so important and that is from uh, mrs maiden name who said and the government can cut off supply at any time that's exactly the scenario that we're setting up that's the state of affairs that we're creating it's very easy as you said it's very tempting to uh, give all to outsource all these responsibilities to the government for your security for your food for your safety for the cleanness of your environment for all these things, for your transport, all these things, you outsource to the government. You don't have to worry about them anymore. That's less burden on your back. You can spend more time enjoying sitting under a tree uh, in the sun doing nothing. Um, that's what, what humans are tempted by. But when it comes to outsourcing all these things to the government, they also gain a lot of control. And that is the fact that they can cut off that supply of that basic need that you gave them the responsibility to produce at any time which means uh if you outsource your security to the government and they uh, for example want to use that security against you uh, through the police or through the military they can do it or for example the other side of the coin is they can firstly they can use it what i explained is that they can use it for nefarious purposes by turning off the supply and saying well if you don't act or behave in the way we want to, you're not getting that thing back that we supply to you, whatever that uh, privilege or item or product may be. The other side of the coin is the government losing capacity to produce that item or that service or that product. So it's not that they are using it as leverage. They're not using it with their hand on the tap and threatening you and say, well, open the tap again once you uh, do what we say. But rather, as we see in South Africa often, the government just simply can't fulfill that mandate anymore. They simply can't produce that product or service anymore. And we see this with municipalities, with basic service delivery. I think that's one of the, the, the main reasons uh, why people protest in South Africa is because of lack of service delivery. All these services that the government has promised to give them and that, the, that uh, people have entrusted the government to give them uh, 
th those services, when the government loses the capacity to provide them with that, that's the other side of the coin, which also makes it dangerous. So just to, to end off the very important point that uh, the, the viewer made there, that firstly, the government can use that as leverage when they have responsibility over all these things that you gave them to turn off that tap and to coerce you. And on the other side, you also risk the you run the risk of the government collapsing or losing capacity and then also not getting that very necessary resource or service. Yeah. So so on the first part of it, in terms of the government, you know, deliberately doing it um, against you, we saw that with, with the pandemic. So initially, there's a big pandemic, and uh, here's the government that's coming to save us. So he calls the family meeting and tells us that we've got this, we've got the first couple of cases, and uh, we, uh, we, please, we are going to save them. People, the, 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 the majority sentiment in the country was positive. Yes, please save us, you know, implement this lockdown, and um, you are ground us, as you, I like the way the word you put, that ground us, basically, so that we, you know, we can, you know, get this. So that's the power we gave. Yeah, the save government. us, Father. <laughs> yes, three weeks became six weeks. Became we'll we are we are monitoring this. Um, you know, it's it's spiking, and then when it goes down, we will we we are trying to build some capacity in hospitals, and when we've got enough capacity, we will you know we can get back to normal. Then suddenly, I don't think any of that capacity was ever built, and uh, the, the 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 it just kept going. Then eventually, it was you'll only get it when you get the vaccine. We weren't told that right at the beginning. Eventually no. we were told you only get back your freedom when you get the vaccine. So we, we, we gave it to them. We gave them that power in the beginning. We said, you can save us. They then took that power and then basically you know, put, put a gun in our head and say, if you want us you know, to, to give it back to you now, um, you have to take this vaccine. Um, yeah, and you didn't, you didn't, you signed a contract and you didn't read the terms and conditions. You didn't read the exactly. fine print. Well, in, in fairness to us, we didn't have those terms and conditions. So I'll be honest. Absolutely. When they Absolutely. said that initial three weeks, I said, you know, it's three weeks at home. I, I like my home. I don't have a problem with it. And, I will you know, survive. I like moving from anyone. I'll survive. It's okay. Uh, go ahead. I, 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 I had no problems. I won't lie. I, I, I was okay with it at first. Um, but they, they, the, those terms and conditions were not there, but they developed over time. And so that, that's what we've got to realize, that the, it, any power we give government, they, they, they try to make sure they never give it back. So even now when they've said to us, now you are free again, they said we reserve the right to impose it again at any time, you know, if, if, if the numbers go up. So the, 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 that part is important, and that's why we've always got to be careful with what it is that we entrust the government with. And, um, and, then, and then what I want to make a point on with this is it's, it's our own fault as people. It's because we want things to be easy. Mm -hmm. It's because we want easy solutions. It's because we want, you know, we one button pressed and, and things get solved. That's why we, we fall into this trap of entrusting the government with too much. Um, we should be okay with life being difficult. We should be okay with having to do difficult things or having to do inconvenient things, um, you know, having to form families and keep them even when it's difficult. We have to be willing to do difficult things um, ourselves because that's how we retain that power where the more responsibility we give you to government we can't give responsibility without give you don't give responsibility without giving power so we we, we have to embrace responsibility our mindset has to change as a people and um and, and and that's really what creates the monster we create this monster we allow this monster to grow um we obviously don't realize we're allowing it um but we we, we actually allow this monster to grow grow by looking for the easy way out and looking for simple, um, easy, straightforward, one size fit all solutions. Mm. So um, on, the, on, on your second point about, you know, government eventually lacking the capacity to, to, to produce certain uh, things that, you know, they need to give to us. Um, yes, that's the point. It, 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 prom it, it over promises and under delivers all the time. And every time it, it does so, people then argue about how the government should be configured. So then they say, it's because capitalism is not working. Let's try socialism. Then they do socialism and socialism still doesn't deliver everything to everybody. So then well, let's try let's monarchy. Put, <laughs> let, 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 
let's try capture them again or let's try let's try to mix them you know to do, do, do a little you know put them in a blender and mix them and 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 you're arguing over these things but again that you're still sitting with the states the states is still the problem you, the, the problem is still that you are looking for one central place for the solutions to come whereas um, instead of looking at families to start producing homes, to start producing the things that they need um, and being willing to go without certain things that are not really, we think their needs, but they're not. Do you always need the latest phone? Do you always need the latest, you know, this, this and that? You, you know, do you always need the fanciest house? Do you always need, sometimes you've got to also question, you know, these things that we think are needs when they really aren't, you know, um, because that is also what, makes us fall into these traps of, uh, you know, the, these various things. But yeah, the, the government is unable to do it. And we argue about how to con reconfigure the government, whether it should be a democracy or a monarchy or this or that, but we are ultimately still sitting with the problem itself. Mm. No, absolutely. And yeah, and I think when we're talking about a monarchy there, uh, that type of system in our modern times would just be this massive managerial monarchy. It wouldn't be the monarchy of the past. It wouldn't be the type of systems that our ancestors used through monarchy. It would be this massive bureaucratic state still just ruled by a, a king rather than a president. But I don't think uh, when people propose monarchy today, as an alternative to communism or socialism or capitalism, they still imagine it within the parameters of that state paradigm. They still imagine it. It's just statism with a monarchy flavor or with a monarchy clothing on. They, they're not talking about the, the monarchy of the past. They're talking about just a statism with monarchy characteristics, if I can put it that way. Um, and I, I see here, Seeing as we are uh, approaching the end of tonight's conversation, I want to end with this uh, question. The last question I'm going to take from the chat, and that is from Piwe Chombe, who asks, can we speak about proposals? So firstly, I would like to uh, just uh, uh, give my guest uh, the, the comfort that I am completely aware that this is a massive question, that it, this is the question. It's, it's easy well, it's not always easy, but it is easier to identify many of the problems than to propose an alternative. And I don't think I don't think it's always it doesn't mean that uh, you shouldn't just uh, identify the problems and without proposing solutions. Sometimes you don't have the solutions, but you're very good at identifying problems. That's also a good thing. But we also need to occupy our minds, a part of our minds, at least with uh, finding that alternative, uh, finding uh, an idea that we can actually uh, uh, cling on to for the future rather than being trapped, as we discussed earlier, within the statist uh, centralized paradigm. Now, I'm going to rephrase or not rephrase, but uh, go on this question, Tanda, and ask you rather, what are some of the solutions, not the solution, but what are some of the solutions that you think are really, you don't even have to, you don't have to write a thesis for us here on air live, rather just share some of your thoughts on what do you think are some of the solutions that people can, uh, can think about and consider and uh, uh, play with a little bit in their minds uh, going forward. Yeah, I think um, we we one of the things I I had a, a space on on Twitter some time ago where I talked about uh, your your family is a business, and the whole idea there was that uh, we need to get back to our families being centers of production, not just consumption, um, and 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 um, get back to identifying ourselves and where we are according to what we produce rather than according to what we uh, are able to consume. So, um, you know, we've got to get more, um, start start thinking about being more self-sustaining in our own families, um, kind of maybe switch off the television a, a little bit and, and, and get to work as a family. You know, a lot of time is taken up by television and social media and all sorts of things. Get back to kind of, uh, you know, doing that. Train your kids, um, train your kids. In, in what you want them to know and think that they'll be able to do to able to contribute and and you know don't just wait for the school system we didn't even touch the school system and how that contributes to statism that's a whole other subject that we could discuss at some point but basically um after 12 years of, of being in school your child still knows nothing that would allow them to actually get a job 
And so what you need to do is you need to take control and start actually uh, training up your kids so that they, they, they know what, you know, um, if you, if I, I'm a programmer, I teach my kid programming, so he knows programming by the time he's 15 years old and he can already do that. Um, you know, just focus on your family, build your families, um, um, understand that that is actually, you know, change your mind and see that that has been the center of where you need to be. Um, and then, of course, stop giving the state power. You know, don't listen to politicians saying, if you give us this power, you know, this is going to um, change. Stop giving them power. And hopefully we create a movement and at some point we can start taking away power from the state. Um, but, you know, that's a, it's a long process. But the, 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 beginning, the beginning blocks is to recognize how important your family is and how, um, we, you know, we need to form them and we need to sustain them uh, going forward. Mm. No, absolutely. And I think that's a, that's a very good place to start when it comes to proposals for the future, for that paradigm shift, as we talked about earlier. Uh, thank you very much, Arti Pandey. Uh, she says, this is such a great topic and discussion. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the feedback. Uh, Brendan Hill, one of my previous guests, uh, we were talking about exactly what you were, one of the facets of what you were describing there, Tanda, on my episode with Brendan. We were talking about starting your own vegetable garden, growing some of your own food. And uh, you will find that on my channel as well. Um, uh, tips and tricks for starting a vegetable garden and he uh, brendan says the spirit is going around lots of people in my circles going through this shift well that's great to hear um yes says thank you uh, tanda and adams great conversation today thank you very much i really appreciate it as well did your power just go off tanda no shedding eight o'clock <laughs> and unfortunately well, are we also, I, also, I also need to start producing my own power <laughs> <laughs> well exactly to demonstrate that point that we've been talking about this is what happens when you give that uh, responsibility over to the state and say, say, well, just take care of the power generation, please. I don't want to pay for it, uh, pay for my own type of power generation. I don't want to uh, have that responsibility. Exactly what just happened here. That is the product of, but that is the product, not of the state closing the tap to force Tanda to do what they want. This is the product of the second type of uh, threat. And that is state collapse, state deterioration to be able to produce that, uh, uh, that product and to produce that service. Koketsu also says, awesome chat, gents. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Koketsu. All right, we've 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 reached the end now. I just want to, uh, Tanda, I'm going to give you the opportunity now to ask you a question that I ask all my guests uh, before we say goodbye. And that is, if I'm going to give you the opportunity to give anything that you think uh, the audience here tonight can think about this week, something to keep at the back of their mind, something to chew on, on the, the days ahead? What would you give them to uh, to just uh, keep at the back of their mind? It can be an idea, it can be a question, it can be anything that you just want to leave them with before we say goodbye. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess the, um, I, I touched on it a bit at the end, um, talking about uh, the school system that underpins, um, you know, this uh, statism. Um, just think about what your kids are learning, those of you that have kids, and I think many of us here are older and we've got families and kids. Think about what your kids are learning. Think about what you want them to know. Um, be, be, be purposeful, deliberate um, about it, um, and, and prepare your family to be able to actually sustain themselves. I think that's the, that, that's the ultimate thing. Take, take that responsibility to, um, to properly, to prop, to, to make your family a productive family and stop looking towards the state. Stop arguing about capitalism and communism and all that nonsense because all of it is, is, it's, it, it comes through, um, you know, a, a that, that paradigm that basically gets us stuck into these states and, and that, that don't actually help us. So I think that is something that we can all, you know, gather around. So we talk about trying to end racism and trying to end all sorts of things. I think getting back to basics and getting back to building our families can help us realize that a lot of the things we argue about actually don't even matter. And that's what I actually uh, love about, you know, this concept that it, 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 it does kind of bring people together because you and I sit here, we're on incomplete agreement. But if we were discussing how government must solve a problem, you and I would probably disagree. I might say expropriation without compensation and you would be saying, no, we must do it this way. And, and you, we will start fighting. But we, if we agree 
that we need to get back into our families. Um, that's something that actually does uh, bring us together. And that is what is a threat to the state when people come mm. together. That way. Well, Tanda, that's the perfect way to end it. Uh, before we say goodbye, I just want to uh, thank the sponsor again of uh, today's episode, and that is uh, Bitvice. Uh, if you're a South African and you want to know more about Bitcoin or want to get into Bitcoin, uh, you can go check out their website. There's a link in the description. Uh, Bitvice is the only place in South Africa that sells Bitcoin directly to your self-custody, uh, meaning that unlike a traditional crypto exchange, you don't have to trust anyone to hold your Bitcoin for you. This also removes the largest risk associated with Bitcoin. And if you're interested in learning about it, uh, you can go check out their podcast called By the Horns. It's available on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Very interesting stuff. Uh, and then also... Uh, go check out their website. You can just even if even if you don't want to use their service, you can just send them a question. They will they will answer you very quickly. So uh, thank you very much uh, for that sponsorship. And uh, yeah, Tanda, thank you very much for tonight's uh, excellent conversation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, time flew by. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to keep you much longer uh, that you have to sit there in the dark <laughs> so you can go tend to, to other things. But thank you very much for, uh, I really appreciate the, your time and uh, really enjoyed the conversation. And then also thank you very much to everyone that tuned in in the live chat. Thank you for all your excellent questions, all your excellent comments uh, and also your, your support. And thank you to everyone that share this, shares this episode all across social media. I really appreciate it. I see you and I, uh, um, I thank you for uh, sharing this episode. And also, if you're new to this channel, you can uh, leave a like and uh, you can subscribe. Well, you can leave a like if you want to support the channel, but you can subscribe for more conversations like this. And then Tanda, last question, where can people find you? Can they follow you anywhere? Uh, I put a link to your Twitter in the description, but is that enough or was there anything else you want to add? Yeah, that's pretty much it at the moment. Um, as I said to you, I'm, uh, I like thinking a lot, but I'm not a big writer, so I don't have any place where I've written anything, but maybe at some point something might come up and you'll find that on my Twitter account if, any, if I ever start a, a blog or a podcast or something like that. All right. Well, there's a link in the description. So uh, you don't even, if, if you're lazy, don't worry. You don't even have to go type in his username. There's a link in the description. Go check it out. Um, and yeah, Tanda, thank you very much again. And I hope you have an excellent week ahead and an excellent weekend. And uh, we will chat again real soon. Yeah, thank you very much for the invite. So I've enjoyed it a lot. And thank you to all the, the you know, the, the other people that commented. Love, lovely to mm. see that participation. All right. Cheers, guys. Have a good one and God bless.